Here are some of the stories of Barack Obama that you may have not heard and I want to share this to you. He is my inspiration and it may inspire you too by end of this video. By late 2002, Barack Obama had been in the Illinois State Senate for almost six years. He was a member of the Democratic minority, representing a swathe of Chicago's predominantly African-American Southside community. He had done what he could in a state where Republicans ruled, and he was ready for a change. As it happened, so were voters in Illinois, who that November put the Democrats back in power. A few months later, Obama went to see the new state Senate president, and the man who loomed as perhaps the most powerful black politician in Illinois, Emile Jones Jr. He went to see Jones with a big idea. He said to me, Jones recalls, you're the Senate president now, and with that you have a lot of power. Jones then stretches out the word, as if savoring the pleasure of it. And I told Barack, you think I go to a lot of power now? And Obama said, yeah, you got a lot of power. And I said, what kind of power do I have? Obama said you have the power to make a United States Senator. Jones lets out a soft smoky laugh and said to Barack, that sounds good. I haven't even thought of that. Jones then asked, do you have someone in mind? And he said, yeah me. And two years later, Obama was elected to the US Senate. And in February 2007, he announced his run for the US presidency. This is not a story about a presidential horse race or government policy. It's about the making of a man who could be President of the United States in January. The Barack Obama who wrote so poignantly of adolescent alienation and the search for racial identity in his gripping memoir, Dreams from My Father, is the same Barack Obama who learned how to deal with the likes of the chain smoking and gravelly voiced Emile Jones Jr., a man whose mobile phone's ringtone is the theme from The Godfather. Obama's good looks and soft-spoken willingness to ponder or allowed some of the inanities of modern politics have masked the hard inner core and unyielding ambition that have long burned beneath the surface shimmer. He is not and never has been soft. His friends and family may be surprised by the fact of it. I know. I haven't spent a lot of time learning the ways of Washington. Obama said in announcing that he would run for president. But I've been there long enough to know that the ways of Washington must change. Obama's restlessness is a quality that leads him to conclude again and again that the time has come to make a move to take a chance, to aim higher when others are telling him to wait his turn. Far more often than not, his timing is right. As the presidential campaign has whirled through the primary season, Obama's character has been under high magnification. The main point of attack has been that he is not tough enough or experienced enough. The New York Times columnist Maureen Dow titled a column about him, the 46-year-old virgin, and Hillary Clinton openly encouraged this derisive assessment for many months. Yet at the same time for Obama, coming across as too tough too skilled, at the sharp elbowed arts of politics, would undermine the very qualities that make him attractive in the first place. It's a rare talent to wear ambition lightly, and to allow your toughness to be taken for granted. Obama's life and career suggest he has that talent. He long ago decided, he could make something extraordinary of himself. Barack Hussein Obama was born and came of age in Hawaii, the 50th U.S. state, and in many ways among the freest thinking, where mixed-race ancestry is such a given. 
that residents refer to their own backgrounds as chop suey. Where hotel room bureau drawers hold not only the Gideon Bible, but the Book of Mormon and teachings of the Buddha, and where bumper stickers urge Wagmore Bar class. His mother, Stanley Ann Dunham was the white daughter of a Kansas furniture and insurance salesman who moved to Hawaii in search of a new life. She loved the speeches of Martin Luther King Jr. and thought black singing star Harry Bellatoni was, as her son remembers the best looking man on the planet. At 18, she met and married Barack Hussein Obama Sr., a former Kenyan goat herd, and an economist in training who had recently become the first African student in the history of the University of Hawaii. This was in 1960, a time when interracial marriage was still illegal in almost half the mainland states. The couple separated in 1963 when their son was just two years old and later divorced and next married to an Indonesian named Lolo Sutara. Obama met his father precisely once more in his life for a month at Christ Mas in Honolulu when he was 10. She eventually began pursuing a PhD in anthropology in Indonesia and Barack spent four years of his childhood there in the world's most populous Muslim nation because his mother wanted Barack to have the best possible bite at the American dream. She left him in Hawaii for much of his adolescence in the care of his maternal grandparents Stanley and Madeline Dunham who got him a scholarship to the Private Punahou School in Honolulu. He arrived there as a round-faced boy and in left the lanky figure of today. Obama was one of only a few black students in the elite high school of some 1,700. The yearbooks showed him as a respectable contributor but not a star. A friend once scrawled his funny-sounding last name in wet concrete outside the cafeteria as a joke. By diligent effort, constant practice and a mean jump shot, he made the second string of the state champion basketball team in his final year a slot that men have gone to a younger, more promising player. He went to university for two years in California, at Occidental College, and then for two years at New York's Columbia, one of the prestigious Ivy League universities. While he was in New York, his father died at age 46, in a car crash giving the son a sense of urgency about my own life, as he puts it, I made a decision that I wanted to make my mark, he began making that mark in Chicago a center of the American black diaspora, which is the worldwide collection of communities, descended from native Africans, or people from Africa, predominantly in the Americas. Obama arrived there after Columbia, not knowing anyone, but ended up finding his life's work, a deep Christian faith. And Michelle Robinson, the woman who would become his wife and the mother of his two daughters, Malia Anna and Natasha and Chicago still remains his home till today. In his work there, he not only explored his identity as a black American, but then decided to get a law degree at Harvard University, which he believed would best prepare him for public life. Obama owes much of his spine, his audacity and his empathy to a person about whom the public knows very little and Dunham Obama's mother who died of ovarian cancer in 1995 at the age of 52. In the preface to the paperback of Dreams from My Father, Obama writes that if he had known how her life would be cut short, he might have produced a very different book. He dedicated his second book, The Audacity of Hope, to his mother and to her mother, Madeline Dunham, The Women Who Raised Me. For him, he needed to write the book about his father, said Alice Dewey, who was the chairman of Ann Dunham's PhD thesis committee, and became a close friend over many years. But when he says, 
who am I, then Anne is a very important part of that. She was the most hardworking person I may ever have met. She was cheerful, down to earth. She absolutely was the kind of person you wanted on your side in any situation. From barroom brawl to an academic argument. And she was always there for the little guy. I don't think there is any question. Obama said of his mother. She was the most positive influence in my life. For most of the 1970s, 80s and 90s. And shuttled between Hawaii and Indonesia. Doing academic research. Her boldest step of all may have been marrying Barack's father. Obama has acknowledged that the precise circumstances of their marriage are a bit cloudy, even to him. His father was already tribally married to a woman in Africa. And after he left Barack and his mother to pursue graduate studies at Harvard, he married and divorced another American woman. And then fathered a child by a second African woman. Still, Anne Dunham kept up a fond correspondence with Barack's father. Even after her marriage to Sutara. She made sure her son knew about his father's intellect. And his government jobs in post-colonial Kenya. And of the improbable courtship the two students had shared. But Obama's father would remain a distant. Intimidating absent figure. The disappointing details of whose life and career Barack would learn about only much later is that The truth is that no one of the men in my life was that successful or stable Obama said They made an awful lot of mistakes It was his mother's presence and not infrequent absence that most colored his early years She cried easily and remained an impossible romantic she would pull her children from bed to look at a particularly beautiful moonrise. But she also possessed enormous drive and determination. In Indonesia, she would wake Barack up before dawn for English lessons from a correspondence course. Alice Dewey told me that Dunham divorced happily from Sutara, who worked for an oil company and died in 1987 of complications from a liver ailment, in part. He gradually became more and more like a Westerner. And she became more and more like a Davanese. Obama told me he could only laugh at the false press accounts. That portray Sitara as some kind of radical Muslim. Who had sent him to an Islamic school. I mean. His big thing was Johnny Walker Black, Andy Williams records, Obama said. I still remember Moon River. He'd be playing it. Sipping, and playing tennis at the country club. That was his whole thing. I think their expectations diverged fairly rapidly. She was sort of unflinchingly and unwaveringly empathetic, says Anne Dunham's daughter. Maya Sutara Ng, who is nine years younger than Barack. She had an ability to see herself in so many different kinds of people. And that is something she was very strict about with us. That absence of judgment, of acrimony. I think that's something that's been given to us. In Chicago after Columbia, Obama embarked on what he says was the hardest work of his life. Three and a half years of community organizing in the impoverished neighborhoods of Chicago's far south side. His job? To work with the Developing Communities Project. A church-based effort to organize low-income residents to improve local conditions. It was a test of both his mettle and resilience. Gerald Kelman, who hired Obama, told me, Barack never had any practical political experience before coming to Chicago. But he learned quickly. Kelman added, in part, that was a conscious decision that idealism only takes you so far. Even as he confronted the limits of community action, Obama was confronting the limits of his own father's achievements. It was in Chicago that he was first visited by Alma, 
his older half-sister from his father's first marriage in Africa, and began to understand that the figure he knew mostly from letters and his mother's lionizing memories, had in fact died a broken man. His once bright hopes dimmed by political and personal conflicts with the Kenyan regime, and his personal life a shambles of drinking and family dysfunction. Obama visited Kenya, met his extended family of half-siblings, and began to make peace with his father's memory. His father's story became an object lesson. Obama told me. I saw the pain of my sister and my brother of my father's side. They had a tough time. I think it's fair to say and it's a hard thing to say. But I was probably lucky not to have been living in his house. As I was growing up. Part of my life has been a deliberate attempt not to repeat mistakes of my father. By the time Obama went to Harvard Law School in 1988, he knew he wanted a career in the public arena. At Harvard, Obama shone as never before. Jackie Scott Corley, a law clerk in San Francisco who knew Obama at Harvard, says, I've never been in a place with a larger collection of egos. Lawyers in particular, are already type A. He stuck out as putting himself apart from that. Nancy McCulloch, an entertainment lawyer in Los Angeles, was a year behind Obama at Harvard and recalls him as someone who wanted the group decisions to reflect the group's intent, not Barack's intent. When Obama returned to Chicago, he began work on his book about his search for the meaning of his father's life and his own. He joined a local civil rights law firm and began teaching constitutional law part-time at the University of Chicago. In 1992, Obama served as executive director of a voter registration drive that added an estimated 125,000 mostly black voters to the rolls. Four years later, Obama ran for the state Senate. He played hardball, not only knocking the incumbent off the ballot for not receiving enough valid signatures on the nominating petitions, but clearing the field of all other rivals too. He served eight years before being elected to the U.S. Senate from Illinois. One night in the summer of 2004, Obama began jotting down some notes for what would ultimately become a speech that would propel him onto the national stage. He had been asked by then Democratic presidential candidate John Kerry to deliver the keynote address at the Democratic National Convention in Boston. This is the speech in which Obama declared, alluding to predominantly Republican red states and Democratic blue states. We worship an awesome God in the blue states. And we don't like federal agents poking around in our libraries in the red states. We coach Little League in the blue states and yes, we've got some gay friends in the red states. Obama's friend Martin Nesbitt, a successful black businessman in Chicago, spent the day of the speech with him, traveling from appearance to appearance. We were walking down the street in Boston, and this crowd was growing behind us. Kind of like Tiger Woods at the Masters. I turned to Barack and said, You're like a rock star and he looked at me and said, If you think it's bad today, wait till tomorrow. And I said what do you mean? And he said, My speech is pretty good. It was an extraordinary display of self-confidence and self-knowledge in just the beginning of Barack Obama's quest for real power. Thank you for watching. If you like the video, please leave comment. God bless.